From mountain springs to the rivers and tributaries from which we draw to meet our needs, water is the source from which all life flows. Water falls from the sky in drops, blizzards and buckets, snowpacks melting, turning into torrents, seeking their level in lakes and seas, or behind the dams we build to arrest the precious flow of water. Agua. Carving canyons, seeping down from arroyos and washes to the underground aquifers, where we find what we call groundwater to enact a law for the common good. Do you know what groundwater is? From the canal, I would assume, but I don't know. I imagine springs, Colorado springs that produce Coors beer. Groundwater? No. What does it look like in your head when you say the word groundwater? Dirty. <laughs> what do you know about and what have you heard about Arizona's water supply? The water supply is getting lower, um, so depending on where you live, there's a drought. There, there is there talk of it, is there really a drought? There is really one? There is really a drought. Oh, wow. So then we need to make adjustments then? Oh, man. I've been here since 1985, and I've seen a lot of changes, but um, I think here in the next 10 to 15 years, we're going to be forced to look at how we use our water here. Most of us don't know what groundwater is because we can't see it. It's not in our rivers and streams. It's the water that has seeped down from them into the porous strata of underground rock known as aquifers, where it collects and in some cases has gone undisturbed for hundreds of millions of years. The only time we ever get to see it is when we pump it up from our wells to drink, to irrigate our crops to grow food, or to be used by the industries that make the things we need. While some of our groundwater gets replenished by rain or runoff, in most cases, once it is gone, it is gone forever. That is why managing groundwater matters, and why we so urgently need to protect it. Arizona has always been a desert land, but starting in the 1930s, high cotton prices, cheap power, and a prolonged drought created a water gold rush, causing groundwater levels to plummet at an alarming rate. As Wes Steiner, the state water engineer, raised a cry of alarm about overpumping, a legendary crook named Ned Warren was selling the same land multiple times without the water needed to sustain the lives of his victims and reporter Don Bowles was murdered by a car bomb after exposing that kind of widespread fraud and corruption. That was the desperate state of affairs in 1976 when a conflict over the use of water arose between some local pecan growers, the mining companies, and the city of Tucson, and the water interests went to war. The crisis was precipitated by, uh, rather typically actually, a court unable to really figure out a coherent approach to the water issue, uh, issued an injunction which possibly had the effect of shutting down the mining industry in Pima County. That's what kind of really brought it front and center. My name is Jim Bush. I'm a native Arizonan. I'm 92 years old and I represented the Arizona Mining Association. Tucson would have become like the old mining communities. Once the ore body runs out, the town dies. So when the water resource is gone, the city dies. Handed a court decision that would have turned the whole state against them, the pecan farmers had a big problem. I think it was unfortunate for Mark Wilmer, who brought the lawsuit, that he had a gun he couldn't shoot. If he had gotten an injunction, it would have put a number of almost a thousand or more people, maybe several thousand, out of work. The unions would have been upset. The rest of the mining industry would have been upset. And the city of Tucson was going to be upset. So 
He never tried to enforce the injunction. The combative parties asked the legislature to settle the issue. Getting hammered from all sides, the lawmakers established a study commission to try to resolve Arizona's unsolvable groundwater issues once and for all. Unable to find any volunteers for this fool's errand, House Majority Leader Burton Barr and Senate Majority Leader Alfredo Gutierrez asked a 28-year-old Senate staffer and water lawyer, Kathleen Ferris, to serve as the new commission's executive director. So I had been going around trying to find someone to take the job, and no one, no one would take it. So they asked me to do it. And they asked me in a public meeting, and there was a discussion about whether I could do the job or not. It was really embarrassing. The 25-member commission included legislators and representatives of the mines, cities, and agriculture, who had no intention of capitulating to their rivals. With so many cooks in the kitchen, there were plenty of fights, but not much got done until Senate President Stan Turley stepped up and took charge as the honest broker Arizona needed to put water first and let everything else be damned. Stan was one of those unique individuals in Arizona history that uh, had the respect of just about everybody. But despite his presence, things were still going nowhere until Senator Turley, an old rancher himself, declared, it's time for a little nut cutting. Isolating commission members at a remote place called Castle Hot Springs with no cell phones way before the internet, he told the commissioners, decisions will be made. I'm Jack Tobolsky. I was a director of the League of Arizona Cities, which represented all the cities in the state. My name is Bill Stevens, S-T-E-P-H-E-N-S. -E My representation was of the Valley Cities, Prescott, and Tucson. We were, went up to Castle Hot Springs to have a retreat to talk about the issue. We were at loggerheads. That's where push and shove came together. It's kind of interesting, interesting process. Bill went one way and I went the other. Bill went to mate with the mines and I went to meet with the farms. And which one of you was successful? Bill. We made a deal with the mines, and uh, the mines kept the deal, and that played all the way through to the end. With the cities and mines allied for the first time, agriculture was stunned to find itself outmaneuvered and outvoted over the next few days, as a tentative deal was struck. But as soon as the terms of that deal were revealed, all hell broke loose. We knew by the end of Castle Hot Springs that we had a bunch of decisions that were hated by agriculture. In fact, Cecil Miller, the head of the Arizona Farm Bureau, decried this as a rape of agriculture. The farmers believed that the water under their land belonged to them, that it was a property right others were trying to take away. They declared, if you wanted their water, you'd have to buy their land. Oh yes, yeah. Th that was their solution to reducing the water use. You buy our land. And you know, th that prompted the great remark from Tom Chandler who said, uh, Cecil, we're not gonna buy your farm so you can go to La Jolla and raise martinis. But the farmers saw things differently and things got nasty in the rural areas, where angry crowds showed up by the hundreds to denounce the draft report at public hearings around the state. We had the cloud at the public hearings. With the help of a public relations agency, we clubbed them. We got 15 speakers for their four. Don't get the misconception that we'll accept the notion that agriculture is the naughty boy that needs to be taught a lesson. This draft, in my opinion, is a cheap shot, formulated by a bias committee. After the public hearings, the commission was in deep trouble. It became apparent that this bill could never get it past the legislature. Agriculture would stop it. They had that much power. With the furious agricultural lobby blocking it, the groundwater law was going nowhere. Until late in 1979, when the U.S. Secretary of the Interior, Cecil Andrus, warned that the Central Arizona Project 
a federally funded canal to bring essential water from the Colorado River, would not be built unless meaningful groundwater laws were passed by the summer of 1980. He was very blunt, straightforward, and he said, you either pass the groundwater right and get some control of your groundwater and your surface water in this state, or there's not going to be any CAP. I was elated. Gave us a reason and a mandate to get something done. We'd still been talking and we didn't have that happen because everybody was banking on the CAP coming in here. It was the future of Arizona. I applauded. I applauded when Cecil Andrus came to town. It was a ruse. Uh, yes, I, uh, from time to time, said to him, it's now time for you to threaten us. And uh, I will have to uh, deny uh, and complain, uh, even though we have agreed that you're threatening us is the appropriate course. Sometimes in political life, uh, uh, a stick is a way to get things done. Ruse or not, it worked. And the opposing parties believed that they had to listen and work together, or they'd wind up seeing that water they so desperately needed going down the drain, or even worse, to California. With the stakes sky high and progress at a standstill, the competing interests asked Governor Bruce Babbitt to intervene to help them reach a compromise. Babbitt, who had set the whole thing up, agreed. To streamline the effort, a so-called rump group was formed. Oh my. Familiar faces, we all looked a little younger then. <laughs> yeah. uh, remember it well. Oh, uh, nobody's looking terribly happy. Uh, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> Every one of them was tough. Uh, and uh, certainly the, the two lawyers representing the munip municipal interests, the lawyers representing the mining interests, were no-holds-barred uh, characters. The full commission was an unwieldy crew, but everyone in the rump group was an experienced lawyer or lobbyist. All were skilled negotiators, and the serious hard work began for real. My name is Leroy Michael, Jr. I was employed by the Salt River Project Agricultural Improvement and Power District. Uh, they kidded he was the in-house counsel, I was the outhouse counsel for SRP. If, if you take as your business trying to get, convince people to do right, this was the kind of thing you dream of being involved in. I thought it was fun. If it was fun, I missed that part. <laughs> if you ask the question, was there ever a moment when they were about to blow up? Oh, about twice a week. Early on, there were some moments where people were yelling at each other. Billy Stevens was showing his chew on the table like Nikita Khrushchev. Well, from the beginning of this situation, I felt it took a lot of courage to even get up in the morning and get back started downtown again. <laughs> With all of these, there's a lot of animosities developed in this that were evolved over a period of time. Almost every negotiating session was intense for me because it was kind of two to one against me, and uh, uh, so I always had to be on my toes. Um, you know, from my perspective, the other side beat me up pretty badly, and uh, uh, we gave too much, but. Uh, I suspect the others might have felt the same way. It was important. I hated to lose. And I, in many areas, I thought the mining industry had been uh, discriminated against. Their taxes were higher. From the beginning of this, for the rest of the time, my kids growing up would always say, Dad's off to a groundwater meeting. That was, when I was leaving home, I was off to a groundwater meeting because that's all it was for, uh, you know, months and months and months on end. The sessions were long and intense, generally ending with cocktails from Bill Stevens' office bar. It wasn't a matter of Republicans versus Democrats. I happened to be a Republican. Tom Chandler was a Democrat. I don't know what Johnson was, but we were the trio representing the mines. And it wasn't about beating the farmers anymore. Agriculture had a huge stake in the deal and had to benefit too. You couldn't resist making some changes if it, 
looks like it went against your position if you're going to, you had to give in on some things. Yeah, that was something I, we hadn't, I'd never faced before. It wasn't strictly a matter of economics and need for water to live in Arizona. There were moments when the whole thing was about to break down, but desperation saved the day. At one of the final meetings, the assured water supply requirement for new housing was cut from the act, and Kathy Ferris felt betrayed. Jack Dabalski and I had cooked up the idea that we should require new homes to have a 100-year assured water supply before they could be built. And it, I was passionate about that idea. And toward the end of the negotiations, for some reason, it fell off the table. In fact, Bruce Babbitt said, well, I guess we're going to have to put that issue aside. And I got up, I was sitting there, tears starting to flow down my face. I gathered up my, my books, my papers, everything, and walked out of the room in the middle of the negotiations. It, it did get a little dicey in these discussions when uh, Kathy Ferris and the staff people are starting to act like th they are players at the table. And I'm kind of saying, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, go back to your cage. Uh, at the same time that I'm saying, wow, that's an important idea. And it's not going to be pressed vigorously by any of the parties at the table. And all of a sudden, it's thrown into the mix and it starts to stick. And then we have to deal with it. Shared water supply requirement matters because it says we're not going to have growth without water. We will have water in hand before growth is allowed. Through all the ups and downs of the grueling process, the one constant was leadership. I don't think there has been a governor ahead of him or one since that had the knowledge about water that Bruce did. He, he was exceptional. You know, there are a lot of people who believe they're the smartest guy in the room. He was the smartest guy in the room. Alfredo was there, and Barr, Burton Barr, in his own way, just put a wet blanket over the house. No one had the ability to get out from under that and, and make trouble. That kind of leadership is just not there. Maybe they'll call us all back. <laughs> and in the end, everyone involved figured out that they would have to sacrifice personal interest to enact a law for the common good. The founders of our country understood that the way that we would get things done is having all the people with vested interests come together and fight it out in an arena in which it could be done productively, constructively, uh, for the good of the whole, with compromise, everybody having to have made compromises. When the last points were hammered out, Kathy Ferris and staffers Barbara Goldberg and Bob McCain took the complex deal and with legislative counsel Dave Thomas drafted the 176-page bill with the assured water supply requirement right back in it. Knowing how quickly it could all unravel when others lit into it, everyone agreed that if the legislature or the courts tried to say yes to some provisions but no to others, the entire historic act would be null and void. It was take it or leave it. I think the most important thing we did was put a non-severance clause uh, in the legislation because in retrospect, the courts could have picked it apart uh, piece by piece. And that uh, when you put a non-severance clause, you're basically rolling the dice. You're basically looking the court in the eye and saying, okay, it's all or nothing. We dare you uh, to overturn the whole thing. The good news is that never happened. And three and a half years after the work began, the Arizona legislature passed the landmark bill without a single amendment. And the Groundwater Management Act was signed into law by Governor Bruce Babbitt on June 12, 1980.
For the first time, California's governor has imposed mandatory water restrictions on residents there, as well as businesses and farms. The state wants cities and towns to cut usage by 25 percent. Unlike California, we have been planning and investing for just this day for, for decades. So, for example, Arizona passed the 1980 Groundwater Management Act 35 years ago, and that has really reduced our dependence on groundwater, but at the same time, it's required mandatory water conservation by water users in the most populous areas of the state. It also does not allow new ag land to come into cultivation. I'm Ronald Rayner. Uh, I'm a farmer here in the Goodyear area. This farm uh, that we're at today uh, was started by my father in 1946. Uh, so I was five years old when I moved here. So I've been farming at this location for right at 50 years full time. In retrospect, the Groundwater Management Act uh, really was good for agriculture. It protected uh, what rights we did have uh, to pump water. It quantified it and it gave us a grandfathered irrigation right. The Groundwater Management Act is all about balance. It allows the cities, industries, and farmers to coexist, to have the water they need to thrive. And without that, we don't have a healthy state. The act has served Arizona well. But while its use has been reduced significantly, too much groundwater is still being pumped. Politicians, pressured by the usual suspects, have allowed exceptions to creep in. And in many non-regulated areas, homeowners are seeing their wells run dry as farmers compete, digging deeper and deeper for whatever water is left. Like the people said, there's a drought and when this one ends, there will be another. It's a desert land. The 1980 Groundwater Management Act is a lesson in leadership, action, and compromise. But climate change, population growth, and new technologies pose new and more difficult challenges. And the work is far from over. Those before us did their part. Now it's up to the rest of us to do ours. Water is a gift from nature that we squander at our peril. From 1939 until 1979, the state wasted a lot of water, they did nothing, and it was the accomplishment of this group that changed the course of things. Without it, I don't know what would have happened. Crises are a, a, an opportunity, too. They enable change, they, they really do. They provide the, other space for change. We had people that were able to negotiate and handle their own clients and come up with what's right. It's a very artful process. In a democracy. Uh, none of the farmers were happy. Most of Salt River Project was not happy. Limiting the number of uh, acres that would be uh, brought into production uh, is a good idea if you have a limited resource, just like uh, limiting the building of houses in an area with uh, limited resources would also be a good idea. Were the farmers happy with the Groundwater Management Act? I think they were. At least I'm still alive. <laughs> when politicians are in such, are held in so, such low esteem these days, that in point of fact, throughout Arizona's history, we've had people in both political parties that came together to lead and to solve problems that have served this state well. I've never been much at sort of wandering back to attend reunions and uh, celebrate and congratulate ourselves for having uh, saved uh, the state or whatever. But uh, I gotta admit, it is kinda, kinda nice after 35 years uh, to think that there's something <laughs> that's really worth celebrating, and this clearly is. I 
I met and enjoyed an awful lot of marvelous people. I will never recover from the wonder and grandeur of that experience.